Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 29 in which we'll examine how did plants colonize the land and we're going to look at the fossil record, the fossil record evidence for the colonization of land by plants. Some of the first and earliest land plants that we see in the fossil record. Now the oldest, most contentious possible land plant that's been described, this is Allodonta phyton, which was discovered in Siberia, in Russia, um, and described in the 1950s as a possible early vascular plant. Um, however, many people since then have questioned whether this is an actual true vascular plant. Uh, many people have argued that instead of being a vascular plant, it's actually a green algae, um, and that's not, a, not necessarily a bryophyte like we've seen before. Now, a couple things we notice in this fossil, we don't see any uh, sporophytes. It appears to be sort of a long piece with some um, pieces coming off of it. So it kind of looks like some of the green algae that we've seen before. So it's a very contentious fossil, whether it actually is a vascular plant or not. It closely resembles another fossil that's uh, known here in Utah, in North America, and that's Margarita Doris, which is found in the Spencer uh, Shale member of the Langston Formation. It's also been found in the Wheeler Shale, uh, which are all Cambrian units. So these are, you know, on the order of 500 million year old fossils. And most people here in in the North America that study these. Um, uh, Wolcock was the first to describe these in the 1930s, have argued that these are actually a form of green algae, and they don't see necessarily any vascularization of these, uh, these little stems. But you can find some of these green algaes in the Cambrian, uh, very common. Um, there's some fantastic specimens that have been found uh, here in Utah that sort of resemble the same things that are found in Russia and Siberia. So these are you know, most people regard these as green algae and hence not quite land plants that we've been looking for. And of course, they're all found in marine systems as well. So that's an indication that these, uh, these fossils are probably uh, green algae that are fully aquatic. So looking at these, we realize also that both um, Alleophyta and Margarita lack the spora, sporophytes. So they don't have that generation of those uh, pillars that come out that we see in a lot of bryophytes that produce the spores. Uh, we also don't see any evidence of vascularization. So if you look at cross-section through these stems, you don't necessarily see any uh, xylem or phylum. You don't see any sort of uh, uh, hard parts in there that are going to help be the network of tubes that are going to help support uh, water being distributed throughout these. So they're probably all fully aquatic, uh, both of these genera, and uh, hence they're not really true um, plants, vascular plants, land plants. So <clears throat> let's move on. We'll move more recently to, uh, to the late Silurian. And the late Silurian is actually a really interesting time, especially if you're interested in this transition from uh, water to land in terms of plants. And this is Bragranathea. And Bragranathea is an amazing fossil. Um, best record of this fossil comes from Australia. Um, but it's also been found in Europe and Asia as well. And you can see that it looks very similar to the green algaes that we saw before, but there's a couple interesting things. So people have studied um, bra bra Ragwanathea um, and looked at some of these leaves and they noticed that there's different structures in there. So they actually have a sporophyte um, portions that come off these stems. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Um, so this is, uh, the other thing they can do is look at a cross-section through these and they see that there appears to be some vascularization um, in these branches as they branch apart. So they have these really small sporophytes that are distributed along these columns as they grow. Um, and they're known from the upper Silurian to lower Devonian. Um, so dated around 430 million years ago. So not as early as those Cambrian fossils I showed earlier, but we're moving on to the Silurian and we're going to start to see more plants that really resemble these early land plants that we see. Uh, it's found pretty much worldwide, so many of these fossils got around. Um, it was advantageous to produce those spores and they're able to grow and colonize. Now they're not very big. This is sort of a reconstruction of one. 
Um, here's another model. This is a reconstruction of uh, Bragg Rang Wanathia by the um, Museum of Victoria in Australia. A really cool reconstruction. I mean, if you saw this growing in your house, <coughs> you'd probably be like, oh, what a queer, queer little, you know, ferny plant. Um, you know, a little mossy plant, but this gives you a good sense of what these early uh, land plants were starting to look like. Now again, these were still reproducing uh, in the water. They were only found in moist areas. Uh, they don't necessarily have a thick cuticle, so these are sort of fossil bryophytes that we're seeing. Now probably the one of the most famous early land plants is Cooksonia. Now Cooksonia um, was discovered many years ago in, in England in the middle Silurian, middle to late Silurian of England. And what's really interesting about Cooksonia is that the only indication we get in the fossil record of, is of the sporophyte generation. So we don't get any of the leafy part of this fossil bryophyte. We only get that portion that produces the spores on top of these stalks. And these stalks are, are um, Lots of fossils have been found over the years of Cooksonia, uh, and we can study the stalks that are the spore-bearing uh, uh, little fruits on the ends of these things. So of course we don't see any of the branchy leaf structure of the gamophyte generation, which is pretty bizarre and kind of weird why we don't see that. So these are the only structures they could preserve. Um, on the top of these stalks are the spore-producing um, portions of these, uh, these plants. One of the really interesting things that we see with these is that they have multi stalks, multi sort of spore bearing fruits on the ends of these sporophytes, uh, which is very different than what we saw in the liverworts and the hornworts. So, in the liverworts and the hornworts, we kind of saw a single stalk coming up um, and producing the spores. In Coxonia, there's multiple ones, which is probably, you know, a fairly advanced. Uh, feature that you see in these plants. So the sporophyte phase is the only phase that's preserved in the Cooksonia. They're known from the middle Silurian to early Devonian. And they're found worldwide, although most of the specimens that have been studied come, come from uh, the British Isles uh, around England. Now there's another fo early fossil um, from Asia that's also a contender. Um, kind of shows some uh, sporophytes as well as some of the gametophyte parts of the plant. Um, the middle Silurian, it's been discovered, is also known from the early Devonian of China. And this is Ganna Nana, uh, Ita, and it's a, um, another fossil that appears to be a fossil bryophyte. So one of the things that, that scientists, paleobotanists have been doing with these plants is kind of getting a detailed uh, picture of their anatomy. A lot of this is using very fancy tools, like uh, doing some amazing um, acid prep, also using SEMs um, and also using micro CT scanning to look at the, the ends of these structures and to try to kind of uh, see how these um, sporophytes um, compare among each other. And one of the discoveries is that there's actually multiple different types of, of these early bryophytes. And actually there's a huge diversity of these as we look at the distribution of their different branching patterns as well as the anatomy of the spore bearing fruits. So this is a uh, Steganathia, uh, another Cooksonia-like uh, plant. Um, this is a, a recent review paper looking at the diversity of many of these early uh, plants in the late Silurian and early Devonian. So we're starting to get a picture that these early bryophyte plants, there's an incredible diversity of them. They're not, they don't just belong to one or two different groups. There's actually many groups, and they can be classified based on the anatomy um, the structures on the sporophyte uh, portions of the plant. These are the reproductive uh, spore bearing fruits. So these are really interesting to look at and we're starting to get a real good picture that during this period of time, during the late Silurian, early Devonian, plants were just going kind of crazy, diversifying, but they were all very primitive, very similar to what we have in living mosses, bryophytes such as liverworts and hornworts. All right, some of the adaptive features we see in these fossils include the erect sporophytes. We see the possibility of coelom and phloem in some of these. Um, we also see evidence of stomata, possible guard cells that are around these as well. We see rhizomes, these are the root-like structures that are gonna hold down these, uh, these plants to the ground. And we see both the sporadophytes and gametophyte phases in a life cycle. So very similar to what we see in modern bryophytes. 
Most of these fossils, however, are really small. They're less than 20 centimeters tall. So you're, you're talking about, you know, sort of grass size, moss size sorts of land plants at this period of time. Nothing bigger than that. All right, so there's a lot of wonderful reconstructions like this reconstruction here of a Silurian forest. Um, and you look at this and you're like, oh, wow, look at that. You know, these bizarre, weird plants coming out, um, out of the waters. But let's throw in a scale here. So here's a shoe. I threw my shoe in there. And you can see the scale of this forest. So these are all very small plants, mossy plants growing out, um, very small, not getting very high um, in size during the late Silurian and early Devonian. So here's another uh, artist reconstruction of the Silurian forest, realizing that those are all Cooksonia and other types of bryophytes, and they're all, you know, really small, close to the ground, uh, only living around wet, moist areas where they can reproduce, and there's not the difficulties of being totally desiccated. So there, these are sort of like the amphibian early uh, plants that we see coming out onto land. Now, of course, this is just the beginning, and this is going to be the beginning of the rest of the course in which we're going to look at the incredible diversity of plants that occurs as we march into the late Devonian and into the Carboniferous, into the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian periods. And during that period of time as we enter into the into this Carboniferous period um, over the next several million years we're going to see a huge proliferation of the various uh, different major groups of plants. We'll get the locophytes, we'll get the horsetails, we'll get the ferns, and then as we march in we'll get the first uh, gymnosperms, the first seed plants, and then we have the last big proliferation of plants with the angiosperms that occurs during the Cretaceous. Now the important thing to think about is that with these early Silurian plants, insects were also coming out of the water and living fully terrestrially uh, on land. And there's basically just two groups that are doing this at the very beginning. We have the Archaeonathid um, insects and the Monera insects coming out. Most of these are feeding on that organic matter that's produced by these very primitive bryophytes. And so they're very small. None of these are uh, flight insects. They're just hanging out, eating on this organic matter. Now, of course, this is the beginning of a huge diversification of insect diversity that we're going to see explode as we go march into the Devonian and as we get into the Carboniferous, insects just become really dominant. So this is just the beginning of insect diversity. Um, so during the Silurian and early Devonian is a time when insects were just getting their start on land as well. During this period of time, we also have the arachnids. In addition to the insects, we have the centipedes. We have some tiny mite-like spiders that are coming out. They have a fossil record extending back to the, early, to the late Silurian. Uh, scorpions are fairly aquatic, but some of them are coming out, hanging out on land um, during this period of time, this major transition in changing the landscape, of making the landscape more green, and changing the entire sort of makeup of the insects, and arachnid faunas, the arthropods, starting to come out of the water and hanging out because they now have food source and they, they can feed and have a new, uh, a new food source at the bottom of a food chain. So during the Carboniferous, we get arachnids become very common, and we get the fully terrestrial scorpions that start to come out during the Carboniferous, and arachnids starting to diversify during that period of time. And then, of course, all of this leads to a uh, diversification of the tetrapods of our ancestors coming out of the water. So this big transition that happens during the Devonian among vertebrates of uh, fish that become get limbs and start coming out of the water during this period of time. So this transition from the Silurian to the Devonian is a major transition in transforming the terrestrial environment. So during the Ordovician period of time, so from about 485 to about 443 million years ago, there was no plants on land, there were no insects, there was basically nothing, just rock uh, in the terrestrial realm. All organic creatures were living in the water. But then, as we reach into the Silurian, we start getting plants that start coming out of the water, and so we have Cooksonia, and we have some of these early bryophytes appearing as far back as 430 million years ago during the Silurian. 
Um, and then these are quickly followed by the first insects, the first arthropods uh, coming out, uh, including some primitive insects and arachnids that start appearing in the lower Devonian, and then we get the millipedes and centipedes, the millipora, that start coming out during this period of time as well. So you can think about this, that the plants were had to be the first group to come out onto land, and once they came out onto land in these very wet, boggy areas, mosses, they provided a food source for many of these arthropods to come out. And that's going to lead up to, eventually, in the late Devonian, where we get the first tetrapods, like Tiltaka, that come out of the, uh, the water, and our ancestors making that transition from being fully aquatic to being fully terrestrial, eventually. So now, all of these animals are still tied to the water. The plants are going to be tied to the water for reproduction, as well as the early tetrapods, the early amphibians as well, for, uh, for living close to the water. So we see this major transition happening during the Silurian into the Devonian. So it's a major important time for this transition of life coming out of the oceans and taking over the land for the first time. Thank you so much for watching this lecture. If you're interested in taking a geology course at Utah State University, check out our website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and the research that I do, check out my website at benjamin Thanks again for watching.